Another way we could kind of, another way we could look at that scripture gives us, you know, scripture looks at things from lots of different angles. And another way it looks at, at um, the problems of the of human existence is it has the word the flesh. When Paul talks about the flesh, he's talking about inner selfishness. He doesn't, in fact, he uses the term very different. The flesh is not the body. The word flesh is sarx in Greek. The word body is soma. In fact, in one place he says you have to destroy the flesh in order to save the body. But sometimes Christians think of flesh being our body, like our body has to be gotten rid of. But that makes no sense because we're going to be resurrected. So the body is, is an integral part of who we are. But it's that inner selfishness. And the reason Paul calls it flesh is he's talking about when we're trying to do anything simply by our own power for our own glory. All we are is flesh that will pass away because it's not grounded in God. Then the term world. Similarly, the world is not the earth. Just as human beings were created good, but we have this struggle against the flesh, the world is good, very good in fact, but we have a struggle against the world. By that, he means the fallen human society, right? As, as we get together, our sin doesn't get better, it magnifies. And we make whole social institutions and structures out of sin, and they'll be differ from culture to culture, but you see these problems of fallen society. And so because we're all born in a society, no one lives in a vacuum, those ideas those things permeate us even in our in our faith and then finally the last one the devil that struggle against the spirits that kind of stand beyond and above all of this so all of them though whether they come from inside from outside or from beyond um, uh, just a little blurb St. John of the Cross has a has a good sort of um, advice I guess he said the world is the easiest to overcome, right? There's a lot of people who have no faith whatsoever, and they sort of turn their backs on the world for a variety of reasons. He says, the devil is the least understood and needed to worry about. We give him way more credit than we need to. He says, but the flesh is the only one that will be with you to your dying breath. That you never stop being yourself. So that's the one you should really focus most of your attention on. But no matter where the problem comes from, how sin operates, whether it's from myself, from outside myself in the world, all around me, or whether it's from something else, I, I put them as four D letters so that they're easy to remember. Sin always does one of four things, or multiple things. It's always set to deceive us, to divide us, to distract us, and to discourage us. Primarily, it sets out to deceive us, to not see the truth or recognize the truth. And by doing so, then it can divide us. It can divide us from God. It can divide us from human, other human beings. It can divide us from the earth. It can divide us from within ourselves. So in other words, sin seeks to place us back in, the, in that experience of the fall. It seeks to magnify and keep that in place. If it can't deceive us, it will at least distract us. Or you can, another D word, which everyone speaks more to you. Or divert us. Well, if it can't get us to totally acknowledge its lie, it can at least give us enough fun stuff to do that we waste our life doing it. And when we end up dead, we've lost our time for salvation. There's a lot of great things in life. And so there's a lot of places you can get caught up in. In fact, that's this is, I don't know, this I've always thought this was interesting. Latin, the term glamour, it's Latin. Isn't that funny? I'm sure I, how many people in the industry know that. But the word glamour itself means illusion. Because that's what we're under. We're under a spell. Glamour referred to spells. When a person casts a spell over you. That you don't see reality. You live under an illusion. So that's so we get distracted by sort of nice things, fun things, shiny objects, whatever you want to think of it. But we lose our course. Or it discourages us. You know, it, it makes us feel like, oh, we can't do it. What's the point? I'm just going to give up. Don't worry about it. And so it's this is how sin tends to work. Now, I'll just mention four of the lies, the deceits that are common ones. But obviously, there's many, many ones. 
And I'm not talking about, I mean, obviously the devil tries to twist the truths of the faith in terms of, you know, whether God exists, whether it's Trinity, you know, the incarnation, things like that. But I'm talking more about sort of lies in our relationship, whole experience with God. Let me just give four. The first lie is that I have to meet certain standards in order to feel good about myself and for God to accept me. That's Paul's whole point, is that that doesn't work. And the person who has that has this perfectionism, fear of failure. They're driven to succeed at any cost, oftentimes to manipulate others or use them or blame them for their failures or to excuse, and withdraw from healthy risks because they don't want to fail, so they won't even bother to try. But God justifies us. Right? He answers that lie by forgiving our sins and giving us a share in the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. In Jesus, I am already fully pleasing to God. Does that mean he's not upset or concerned when I'm sinning? Certainly he is. But he's concerned because he doesn't want us to lose our relationship with him. But from his standpoint, he loves us whether we're sinning at our worst or whether we're at our best. He loves us. And so we need to get rid of that lie. I have to keep doing a certain standard, you know. We drive ourselves beyond what God wants of us. Um, number two is similar, but instead of standards for yourself, you have to be approved by others. Okay? I have to meet the standard of the approval of others in order to feel good about myself. So some people are so fearful of rejection. You know, people who are chameleons, they attempt to please others at any cost themselves overly sensitive to criticism. In that, God reconciles us because he brings us into a relationship with him and destroys kind of that um, unworthy feeling that we feel other people need to be the ones who tell us if we're good or bad. Not that we're to be apart from human relationships, but while we're part of those relationships, they shouldn't be the ones that actually define us in the end. God should, or as the Bible says, be concerned to be pleasing to God, not to human beings. The one person's too afraid of what the other human beings are thinking and not what God considers them to be. But really, all that anxiety and everything will fall away, not with what other people say, because that's going to be bound on their ups and downs of how they feel on that day. Instead, you'll be grounded in God who feels and loves you. Number three, those who fall or fail are unworthy of love and deserve to be punished. A lot of us keep score. A lot of us keep score. And some of us actually want to suffer because we think that somehow makes up for what we did. The problem is, is we actually put on to ourselves far more often, more than God demands or wants or asks of us. And so um, instead, God does what's called propitiation, the Bible says. He satisfies all the issues of punishment. Christ takes the punishment of the whole human race upon himself. He destroys that very need for punishment. This is what Paul was so shocked about. And yet at the same time, so changed his life, but also gave him the insight as to why so many of his contemporary Jews and modern Jews and Christians, I would say, have a problem with it. All the time, Paul's background as a Jew all the time he's thinking that God is reaching this point to settle all the scores, right? It's all going to be settled. The scores are going to be settled. Everything's going to be done and things are going to happen. He is so disgusted, really, by the message of this new self-proclaimed Messiah that Paul actually becomes a killer. He kills, I think we forget that. Paul mentions it. Luke doesn't tell us that way. Luke makes it more vague. Um, probably because Paul's his hero. But Paul mentions it himself in his letters. He sought to kill the church of God, right? That's what he's doing. He's already seen some people die by turning them over for being Christian. And he's on his way to Damascus to bring more back to die. <clears throat> Remember, he's there when Stephen is killed. So Paul's a murderer. And the risen Christ appears to him, and all is forgiven. Paul doesn't have to go and make up even for his murder, not from God's standpoint. It's done. And in fact, that's his thing that he's shocked at. He said, 
God's justice is Jesus Christ. Now, to us, we just read that. It doesn't mean anything to us. But see, if God's justice is Jesus Christ, that means he tells us what that means. He says, God forgave all the sins previously committed up to the time of Christ. Boom, gone. Just accept it. See, the Hebrew way of understanding, the word for repentance in the Old Testament is the word shub. And it means to start over with diligence. The sad part is, is this is what most of us still think repentance is. It's to look and say, man, I screwed up. So now I have to man up and I'm going to do better this next time, right? All it takes is more willpower or discipline. I'm going to do better. Jesus just says, forget it. He equates two words. He says, repent and believe. Don't look backwards to what you did. Look forward to what God is doing. Or upward, if you want to think of it that way. You're not going backwards. You're going forward. And you don't have to start over with renewed thing. You just have to surrender to it and accept it. And if you really do that, your life will start to change. Your actions will begin to change. So there's a whole difference in understanding from the, from the Christian standpoint to the Jewish one. That's why John the Baptist is so upset with Jesus. Remember, John's facing his own execution, and he starts to get a little nervous that maybe he screwed up. So he sends the two disciples of his to talk to Jesus and say, are you the one, or is there still one to come? I mean, our, our scriptures are honest about it. John wasn't sure because he was preaching one thing. Remember how hellfire and damnation is preaching is? The tree, the, the, the axe at the root to cut the tree down. Those will be thrown into the fire and burned away forever and blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus is out forgiving everyone <laughs> and attending parties and mixing with people who nice society doesn't mix with. And John's confused. He says, are you him? And Jesus says, yeah, but how does, he, how does he prove himself by what Isaiah said? I'm there to free the prisoners, to proclaim to the nation, to do these things, to set free the prisoners. I'm not here to condemn. Remember what we talked about earlier. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying there's no hell. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm simply saying the way in which Jesus approaches this situation is one we need to take real, take seriously. Because many of us still live in a very Old Testament milieu of how we approach God. Similarly, how do most, many, I won't say most, how do many people think of the Father? They think of the Father as the judge, the one sitting at the end of time who's ready to just beat us raw for whatever we screwed up on. And only through great suffering will maybe pull us through to the other side of heaven, if we're lucky and it's on his good day, right? I mean, let's be honest. A lot of us, the view of the Father is not, is a little bit scary. And yet, Jesus tells us, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the perfect image of the Father. The Father is no different than Jesus. The Father isn't less compassionate, as if he sent Jesus as the olive branch, and then he gets to wail on everybody if he didn't choose the olive branch at the end. No, the Father is exactly like the Son, or else the Son would not be his image. He's what the Father is like. And so, we need to recognize that, you know, the humility of God. I saw a debate one, not a debate, a talk. Uh, Benedict Rochelle was, uh, was um, discussing spirituality, and it was it was particularly focused on spirituality of death and suffering. Um, with that rabbi who the famous the book was famous several years ago. The um, why do bad things happen to good people? Harold Kushner. Good book, terrible book from a Christian standpoint. Mm -hmm. Because as Benedict Rochelle points out, the way he justifies it in the end is that God isn't powerful enough to stop suffering. And that's, I don't know if you've read the book, but that's Kushner's final point. He still believes in God as a good Jew. His, his son died in a horrible way as a young man. Um, and so he's coming to terms with that. But for Rochelle, that doesn't work. <laughs> if God's not powerful enough, then why, can we, why should we believe in him to be able to save us from anything? And certainly eternal life if he can't even save us from physical death. So, but anyways, in that discussion, something very interesting came up as kind of a side issue, which goes into the same idea of who God is. 
Israel, Judaism, and Islam, the two religions that are closest to us, neither one has the Christian concept of venial sin. Now, Israel knows some laws are, some acts are more heinous than others, but it doesn't matter. You either obey all 613 laws or you don't. And it doesn't matter which ones you choose not to obey, you're now in contempt of the law. Right? So it doesn't have to be the Ten Commandments, it's all of them. And so sin is sin. Whether big or small, sin is sin. And same with um, Islam, it has no concept of little things like that. Venial, and the word venial means a little, a little thing. Venial sin is very odd if you think about it. And this is what Grishel said, and I thought it was great. He said, first he mentioned, um, he said even some saints have struggled with it. And he mentions uh, Teresa of Avila. He said, Teresa of Avila, and I'm paraphrasing because it's been a long time, but he said, Teresa of Avila said, there's nothing she, she has, she holds nothing that the church doesn't teach. She says, but she does struggle with some things. And one, she says, is the idea of venial sin. Because she says, how can any deliberate sin, no matter how small against God, ever be called small? Right? If you're doing it purposely, how can it be a small thing? <laughs> but as Grishel points out, he said, but then she accepts it because she's a faithful Catholic. But as Grishel points out, it teaches us something about God. Not only does God forgive our serious, serious rebellions and injustices against him, serious sins, mortal sins, but God allows himself daily to be just kind of treated indifferently, callously, ignorantly, shamed by his creatures. And he does nothing. He doesn't require anything for them. We can get rid of them and should, but he doesn't punish us for them, per se. He doesn't do anything. He allows himself to be slighted over and over again by all of us multiple times daily and he just takes it why because that's god and so jesus tells us believe believe that what i'm telling you is true god is already in your midst god is in the midst of you god has forgiven you now accept it that's how you repent your repentance is to accept it accept the good news and start living as if it's true now and then the fourth lie that we're told off though is the one, I am what I am and I can't change, so it's hopeless to try. But God regenerates us and making, makes us new people in Christ. And in one of his letters, Paul gives a lit litany of all these different types of sin and lifestyles. He says, you were, blah, 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 and he lists these like 20, 30 sins. But then he says, but you're not anymore. Right? You can overcome these things, not because you do it by force of will, but because by the grace of God, he works in you to change it. Because what God will do, here's another letter one for you guys to memorize. What God will do is he'll take the precept, that is the law, the rule, his command, that was a prohibition and if you surrender and are faithful to him, he turns it into a promise. Now what does that mean? What Bonaventure means, he's the one I get this from. Bonaventure tells us the person who's faithful and tries to obey the laws because they know they're supposed to, often at least some of those laws of God feel like a burden because they're against their life. Let's take a person, for example, um, and this is actually the example one of the things one of them used. Let's see a man who's been promiscuous his entire life, finally falls in love, wants to get married. So now he gets married, and you have the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. And he doesn't want to. He really loves her. But he has a whole history of things. The sacraments aren't magical pixie dust. We don't suddenly become faithful just because we went through a sacrament. God gives us the grace to work with it. But... Those old habits that he has to fight against can feel painful at times. It's a struggle for him. We might not feel bad for him. Maybe I used to extreme and extreme, but you get the idea, it, whatever sin it happens to be. But if he struggles through that and remains true, despite how burdensome it feels at the beginning, at a certain point, 
not necessarily because of what he's done other than his surrender to let God and refuse to refuse to disobey. At a certain time, it just shifts and it becomes who he is. And so the prohibition becomes a promise. It moves from thou shalt not commit adultery as like this external thing holding over his head to thou shalt not commit adultery because that's not who he is and he wouldn't even dream of it. That's what God does. So obedience does have a part. I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong to say there's no judgment. I'm not saying any of those things, but I'm saying God often works in ways that we don't, are not how we understand it to be, even those of us who are Christian. And so David kind of gets to this because on page three at the top, he uses three different words for sin so that he could describe the whole dimension of human evil. He uses the term fault, which means a conscious rebelling. I'm purposely choosing to do evil. He uses the word sin, hata, which literally means a falling short. In other words, I'm kind of, I'm lazy about the whole thing. And then he uses the term guilt. Sometimes it's translated iniquity in some translations, which is going astray due to total disregard. So those are the three places sin come from. Deliberate choice laziness or weakness we could say or indifference and so david is covering kind of everything he's saying with my whole self and all these things i've done i'm truly sorry i mentioned this before but only vocalizing our experiences is the biblical way of understanding that they can be healed if we keep them to ourselves then we're not doing what god has as part of who we are to be healed Vocal protest and spoken confession are what cause Yahweh to act. Silent confession, the Old Testament is clear and the New Testament doesn't change it, will not elicit mercy from the Lord. Because you're not being honest and humble enough. People say, I can just forget, ask God's forgiveness in my room. You can, and I do that too. But let's be honest. There's a way good chance of self-justification there because God has never spoken to me yet. But I confess, and then after a while I think, eh, that's not really that big a deal, right? Confessing just to yourself in your room to God is the easiest way to go down the wrong path. Dante's famous quote, right? Not Dante, but um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you see, to have to go to another person and say it out loud vocally and condemn yourself and then hear a response, the bad response of here's what you need to do, because often we don't give ourselves penance when we confess <laughs> to God, right? And two, to also hear the word spoken, you are forgiven. Those are important, and they've been part of the faith from the beginning. Like I mentioned, every time it says in the Old or New Testament, acknowledge their sins, confess their sins, it always means public. There would have been no understanding of David of just some private confession. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you don't first confess and you feel bad and you're admitting that before you go to the act of confession. Certainly there's that. But just being quiet about it all in your heart doesn't solve anything. Remember what I talked about, at the depths of who we are is nothing. And so we sort of delude ourselves, one of the deceptions again, that we can just sort of determine our own means of forgiveness and, and that God's going to forgive us or not. So God requires this kind of idea. And we see it, remorse, inner justification, simply self-counseling or talking, none of those are confession. Here's what St. Augustine commenting on this psalm says. Do not claim the right to the kingdom on the grounds of your own justice, nor the right to sit on the grounds, nor the right to sin on the grounds of God's mercy. So on the first half, he's referring, and Augustine, of course, is, talk, is putting it in the context of confession, as he knows as a Catholic as well, oral and, and to a priest. So he's mentioning the fact don't don't claim your own justice as if you go in your room and say and you can just declare God forgave your sins because that's what you're doing. You go in the room and say, "Oh, I'm sorry for this and this and this, and now I'm forgiven." How do you know? How do you know? You're claiming your own justice for it. So he says that doesn't work. 
He said the other one doesn't work as well either. He says, and don't claim the right to sin on the grounds of God's mercy. Well, God is merciful. He knows he's going to forgive me. He will if you repent. No repentance, no forgiveness. God is merciful, but he doesn't give us our own choice of how we come to that mercy. He gives us mercy and says, here's how you accept it. And it's just something we have to reconcile, reconcile, recognize because it's part of our, our understanding of how we heal. Now, what's interesting, though, is the Bible sometimes speaks about God repenting. What that means is sometimes God will do something, um, sort of give us a special grace, even in the midst of our sin, because he wants to sort of entice us to confess and do what we're supposed to do. We're not doing it. And so rather than being heavy handed on us, he kind of entices us by repenting. That is, he changed. But what, what they mean by God repenting is he changes his tactic, sort of. He does. He gives you a big carrot to say, come on, do what you're supposed to do. Now, this is not, it's not our thought process, generally speaking, but it's very biblical. Turn back to the first page and look at how, how David describes the first stanza of, of Roman numeral two. He's describing his problems. He says, because I kept silent, my bones wasted away. By that, he means to say that the situation is hopeless because in the Hebrew mind, remember, I put up that image of the body with the three parts. The bones are the last part to dissolve or decay, and therefore they stand for stability. So if during your life, you poetically say, my bones are wasting away, it means you're on the way to death. There's nothing that can save you. It's hopeless. So it's a poetic way of David saying, bodily, physically, I'm feeling these problems. He groaned all day and night. So he's constantly feeling the weight and burden of these sins and his guilty conscience. And then his strength withered as in dry summer heat. Now, remember Psalm 1? The righteous person is the tree planted beside the stream. Its leaves never wither. So he's admitting, I know I'm not righteous right now. And so my strength, I'm just listless. I'm becoming, you know, we'd say depressed probably in, this, in modern times. So he's experiencing this depression, physical problem from what's happening and this sort of sense of burden. But here's the interesting thing. Day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. David acknowledges that the reason he has these experiences is because it's God. See, we sometimes probably badly, we tend to think of God as way up here. And, and if God's involved, he's kind of involved at a way far distance through all these intermediary stuff, right? He comes to us through this and angels and the law and the priest and everything else. But what the Bible has always said and what Jesus is the proof of is that God is right here in everything. And so David's struggling with this pain. He's not excusing it and he's not mad at God, but he acknowledges the reason I'm suffering is because of you, your response to what I'm doing. And so for this, we need to recognize and the next psalm we look at next week, which will be Psalm 6. And even though it's earlier, I want to look at it later. That whole psalm is about a person who is suffering. And we're going to look at that on its own. This time, this psalm is mostly about sin, and he only touches on it. So I won't only want to briefly touch on it, because we'll, we'll look at a whole psalm about it. But on page five, I just want to mention something. The link between sin and suffering is complex. And way too often, Christians, and I'm sure Jews as well, tend to go to extremes when explaining or talking about this subject. On the one extreme, you have those who say every single sin or every single suffering you have is a result of sin. Right? That's the answer of Job's friends and other, other people. Um, Christian science, right? Every suffering we are experiencing is because of some kind of sin. Or you have another extreme which says there's no link whatsoever between sin and suffering. Well, as always, the truth is kind of more in the middle. Both simplify a, a complex topic. The first thing to notice is the book of Job, the whole book, 
And Jesus' denial of the blind man having been blind because of his or his parents' sin show us clearly that you can suffer apart from any link to a personal sin of your own. Certainly people suffer that has nothing to do with their own sins. But that's not always true because Jesus also told the man who he healed at the pool of Bethesda. After he healed him, he later saw him and this is what he told him. Look, you are well. Do not sin anymore, so nothing worse will happen to you. Clearly, that man's condition was due to his sin. And think about the paralyzed man who's raised down from the, from the roof. What does Jesus do? He forgives his sin. That's not why the guy came. He was probably really annoyed. right? That's not why he came. He came to be walked. And Jesus only does the second one as a result of it. Indicating again, the sin and the condition were connected. And so the easiest thing to say is, the short answer is this. Sometimes our suffering is due to our personal sins. Sometimes it's not. The only person who knows is God and you who's suffering. If you seek to know, it'll be revealed eventually. On a practical level, from a pastoral standpoint, always assume it's not due to any personal sin. And only after prayer and a lot of, and some time of going on that assumption, if you get more insight, if things come to your mind, then recognize there might be a link. I mean, we know it's true even on a scientific level, right? Psychosomatic things happen all the time, where our body has all kinds of problems because of inner stuff going on or things in our mind that make ourselves sick. So this is just sort of the, the early part of that. But it's too complex for us to be able to answer with any simple questions. God never punishes people with illnesses. Yeah, he does. But not always. In fact, not most of the time. But it's that complex dimension. If we wanted to take it to a higher level, we would say, in truth, all sin is the cause of suffering. Because original sin, and the very fact we're fallen, is the cause for any of the suffering that's not due to my personal sin. And the church has always recognized this. That's why there's two sacraments of healing. Confession, which gets rid of my personal sin. And the sacrament of anointing, which gets rid of the effects of original sin on me. Or at least the suffering. Helps me deal with the suffering. One is connected to a personal guilt. The other is not necessarily, although they'll often do confession with it. But it's not required. But it acknowledges that we have sin that's just from the fact of original sin that affects us. It has nothing to do with us personally, our fault, or anything we've done. And we experience sins, we experience suffering that is due directly to our own fault. And the whole mystery of that is something you and I will never wrap our heads around on this world. Uh, and in the next, we probably won't care, even though I always hear people say, I can't wait to ask God all these questions. You won't have any questions. <laughs> Don't be so taken with God, you're not going to have anything to think about, right? If you, if you get flustered just getting on stage trying to collect your thoughts, there's no way you're going to have all these questions lined up for God and stuff, you know. But, and he won't answer anyway, because that's God. He never answers questions, ever. That's what Job learned. God doesn't come at the end and say, Job, I'm so sorry. Here's why I did what I did. No, God gets on Job, right? He says, who are you to ask me about anything? What would you understand? And here's why God doesn't, doesn't answer questions. If God answered a question, you ask him a question, what's your next response going to be after he answers? Another question. And so you'd live your life in perpetual sort of <clears throat> unease, you know? You're never going to be settled because you're always going to have more questions. God just doesn't answer. He doesn't need to. We might not like that as modern Western people who think we're all equal, but we're not equal to God. Jesus never answers questions. He always answers a question with a question or an insult. <laughs> Seriously, look at the story. How do you, you know, Jesus, how do you do these things? He goes, can't you read? Which is very insulting to the, like, 10% of the population that could read, the Pharisees. That's how he starts his answer. Can't you read? Jesus, who do you do these things by? I'll answer your question if you answer me this one first. When John came, was he the... Jesus never answers questions. He's God. People tell him stuff. What's his answer? You say that. Think about it. He says that to Pilate like 10 times and other people. You say so. 
what does that mean, right? So, so God's not about answering our questions. God's about transforming our hearts to something different. Okay, um, so next week we'll finish this one. We only have a couple pages left, and we'll get on to number six, which is a much shorter one. It's only about four pages long or so, um, which deals with illness. And then we'll have one more for um, the purification part, and then we'll start looking at psalms which are more called illumination. That is, those are psalms that reflect as we grow in knowledge of God, when we start to learn about God. And just a quick wetting of the appetite, what we're going to see is that the Bible understands that there are sort of four, four depths to how we convert. The first conversion is we change our old life. So our, the way of living. Most people never go beyond that, sadly. But there's three more degrees. The second level is we change our thoughts about our old life. What that means is a lot of us change our behavior, but inside we struggle with it all the time because we've never come to a real peace about it. So, you know, you sit there and you think, you know, if I wasn't Catholic, I could be eating meat right now. <laughs> or if I wasn't this, I mean, that's a real simple one. But I mean, we think about, so it never leaves us. We've left Egypt, but Egypt never left us. Then the third one goes even deeper once a person reaches out, and they change their thoughts on God. And the person, some of the people who are best at that level are John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul, and who is God, and what is God, and God in the end is a dark night. Because he's not, what we think we understand about God is really, and even the things we say about God are only relatively true. Is God omnipotent? Yeah, but we don't really have an experience of what that means. Is God a father? Yes. But he's not a father like me. It's kind of an analogy. He's not really a father. I mean, he is, but he isn't. See, it's that kind of mystery of the understanding that we have to realize who he is. And then the fourth one is that when we understand who God really is, then that changes who we understand ourselves to be. Well, if God is that, this, and I'm his image, what does that say about me? And that's the level that Jesus is pointing out when he tells us, um, at this level is Paul, when he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. I've become identified, I'm looking at God now. Jesus talks about this one when he says, um, those who seek to save their lives will lose it, because that's your false self, who you've thought you were all this time. All this has been building up to this. Those who seek to save those, their false self will die and lose it. And those who give their life, die to that false self, will find it, their true self. Or what Paul calls the new man in Christ. Who are we really at the core after everything else has been stripped away? After we've given up the old habits, after we've given up the worries about them, after we've come to really know who God is, then finally at the end, we know who we are. But sadly, as I pointed out, most spiritual directors say most of us never go beyond that. We might dabble a little bit in this, touch on this, a little of this, but because we haven't gone through the process, we don't really know how to handle these two until we've moved forward. So we start to see that in, in the next psalms of illumination as they start to point out how do we begin to go into the depths of you know, that experience of who we are. So, lots of exciting stuff. <laughs> so let's go ahead and end in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you as our Savior and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the giving of your life on our behalf. We thank, for your, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for the new life in the spirit that your resurrection provides for all of us. Lord, enlighten our minds so that more and more we can see through the different lies that we live by. Lies that hinder us from being able to experience the love of the Father in you. Give us the courage as well, Lord, that fortitude to overcome those lies. And in our hearts, increase our hearts. Draw them closer to yourself 
and through that heart-to-heart knowledge as we come to know you and experience you truly as Father. Make us reflect you as a true image of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so that in that reflection, people may see our works and glorify you. As we approach the great feast of Pentecost, the birth of the church and the giving of the Spirit, Lord, we ask that Spirit released at your resurrection that we've just celebrated recently to continue to guide, empower, motivate, and encourage each and every one of us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son. Did you want to hand out?